the leper scholar versus Israel in Isaiah 53, exaltation. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel that is often attributed to Rashi is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Jews for Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in its analysis of Isaiah 53 being the people Israel. The following is from Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. There's been no change to, to anything. This is directly from their internet site, which they allow you to download. They authorize the use of this material. If you're not authorized, if someone doesn't say share this or download this, take this in some manner, authorizing you to take it. You are not to take information from people's websites. But having this authority to take it, the only thing I had to worry about is slander and perjury, and that is not something I would do. I'm a lawyer, very familiar with these things. And this is in quotes. 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall succeed. He will be exalted and become high and exceedingly lofty. The success and exaltation of God's servant is an event that the prophet sees as futuristic. This is Jews for Judaism, and, and that particular uh, verse 12 is different than the one that's used in the Jewish Publication Society's 1985 edition of the translation of Hebrew to English of the Hebrew Bible. I'm not sure where they where, where it comes from. Continuing on with this writing, the immediate context, chapter 52, verses 7 through 12, tells us that this is part of the blessing that Israel will experience at the time of her restoration. This is my commentary on that. In Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, a multiple verse quotation, starting at 13, ending at 15, the verses are combined. The Lord begins to describe his righteous servant of chapter 53. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15 should have been verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. My servant to be exalted and become high and exceedingly lawfully is now the Gentile man God comes with from Adam, a Christian country, and of the Jewish people none are with him. It is not the exiles. It is the Gentile that becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11 after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, verse 10, when he makes himself an offering for gift in a covenant with God. The immediate context of Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 12 is poetry and an announcement of prophecy fulfilled in the return to Judah of all 13 tribes a remnant of each tribe who had been deported and exiled to Assyria, Babylon at one time or another. My servant, exalted, was the Assyrian Babylonian exiles and the victory, this is, this is from verses 7 through 12, and the victory in sight of all the nations was the second temple. It was not a futuristic prophecy. The return included God's forgiveness of all of the sins and inequities of the Assyrian Babylon exiles. <clears throat> Jeremiah's time to come of the new covenant with sin forgiveness in the day of the Lord is for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora, which means outside of the promised land outside of Israel. 
and is futuristic. The translation of Art Scroll and Shabbat of Isaiah 52 that Rashi comments on does not include the quotations that combine verses 13 through 15. The translation used by Jews for Judaism for its commentary also does not have the quotations. They are the only verse quotations of Isaiah 52 and a demarcation of the verses of the fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the remnant of the 13 tribes from exile. They are the beginning, verses 13 through 15, of the description of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and had nothing to do with the exiles. Prophecy fulfilled. That's what chapter 52 is, and it ends in verse 12. God's servant has nothing to do with the exiles. God's servant That's what he always calls him, my servant, my servant. And after chapter 53, he doesn't start calling him my righteous servant. That hasn't changed. After Isaiah 53, it's the only time he ever uses the term. God's righteous servant is a Gentile in the beginning. The translation of the Jewish Publication Society has the quotations. This is their rendition. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. Verse 14, just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Verse 15, just so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My servant is now the Gentile and not the exiles who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of a devotion in Isaiah 53, 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt in a covenant with God. Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation that is missing the quotes from the translation of Art Scroll, Shabbat, and Jews for Judaism. But again, it's they are included in the translation of the Jewish Publication Society. And what's interesting about their rendition is they started from scratch. A complete new translation begun in 1955. Involved were Orthodox rabbi, a Orthodox rabbi, conservative, and reform, along with uh, specialists in linguistics, professors, scholars from universities. It spent it would look uh, 55, and it's it's uh, went to print in 85. So some 30 years of working on this language, and and they 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 use the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have around 1100, I think it is. It's called the Leningrad Codex. And they just they just took it out, started on the first page. Now, all these other renditions are generally, are generally a uh, translation that began with the Leningrad Codex, but it went through several different translators, making different changes. And of course, when this was done, Hebrew had been adopted by the state of Israel, uh, I would suppose in 1948 when Israel was created <clears throat> after the Holocaust. So they, they had a good background, you know. Uh, here, here's how they read. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he has grown by his favor like a tree calm like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty, that we should look at him no charm, that we should find him pleasing. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. As one who hid his face from us, 
He was despised. We healed him of no account. Yet, it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Verse 5, But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 6, we all went astray like sheep, each going his own way, and the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Verse 10, God chose to crush him with disease that if he would offer himself for guilt, he might receive long life and see his children. For a purpose of God, that might prosper. And here they are saying the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. In verse 10, God crushes him on cancer basically to make him offer himself for guilt. And he's exposed to death in verse 11 or 12. No, it's in verse 12. He's exposed to death. So this is a cancer uh the Christian rendition says he's brought to grief by illness. Well, you know, if you're brought to grief and you're exposed to death, it's going to be something like cancer. The speaker is no longer God in verses 1, one through 6. <clears throat> it's no longer God from the Isaiah 52 multiple verse quote, but it's the witnesses of God's righteous servant of the Isaiah 53, multiple quote verse that follows. The witnesses who are Jews identify themselves as ones of the many made righteous by God's righteous servants, saying, it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. That's verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. That's also verse 5. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. That's verse 6, and see offering for guilt in uh, verse 10. That's just bringing out all these words of, of being punished. The quotes beginning at verse 1 and ending... At, after verse 6, identify the speaker of verses 1 and 2 and 3 as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured, that they speak of. God's teaching is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sins, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, and suffering of others. No one or others can be healed or atoned for because another man or men suffer or are beaten or murdered or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? The sickness of the witnesses is not being righteous. That's what the whole story, it's not a song, it's what the story of Isaiah 53 is. You'll see the Jews for Judaism says these are kings of the nations of the Gentiles. You can think of them, since they're supposedly the leaders, that's the Gentiles he's talking about are the witnesses. This is about a man who God specifically crushes with disease, brings him down low to make him offer himself for the guilt, which is an emotion of the Jewish people that they feel for violating his laws, commandments, and rules. That's the sickness. It makes you sick to your stomach when you realize you're not doing well in God's ways. All the problems you have in your family, with your children, with your boss, everything. If you're sinful, if you're not following the commandments God gave you to live your life as, 
in the best way possible in this harsh world. And he knows that. Those commandments are for us. Do not. It, it's just his way of saying, I understand the world's harsh. I have a purpose for it. It's perfect. It's exactly what I want. So, it's, it's God's righteous servant. It's, it's the servant, the Gentile, who suffers by this chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, maltreatment, laid on him by the words and power of God. It's not the world that does this. It's not man. It wasn't the Romans. For Jews, for Judaism, it's, 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 it's not the, uh, the way the Gentiles treated you and what you were put through with all the pogroms and the Holocaust. Etc. Etc. Et <laughs> a purpose, and, and uh, by God's power, to make him suitable for His purpose that might prosper. Now, this purpose that includes His righteous servant, making the many righteous. Well, that's the task of the righteous servant. That's not what God's purpose is to make everybody righteous. No. He's trying to draw people to his prophet, to know who he is by his teachings. That God is with him as he was with Moses. Because as people come to believe who the Moshiach is, who is the man described in Isaiah 53 from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, that the Spirit of God alights upon, according to the sages and rabbis and the Talmud, until, of course, Rashi, much later than the Talmud. And today it's uh, Outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism that, that I see prevalent. I don't know that all rabbis aren't like Mamanese, Rambam, who said uh, Rashi's wrong. He's just flat wrong. It's too inconsistent. It doesn't fit. And Rashi, as I point out in another video, and I believe it gets pointed out in this video, uh, is apparently known for inconsistencies. I, I really can't comment on that. Other than I, I have one inconsistency that I'm, I'm talking about. But we find out what that purpose is in Malachi 3. That's the last chapter, the last time God speaks to, to a prophet. That's, they say, uh, and God stopped talking to his prophets, the Bible closes. And that's Malachi 3. And that's the day of his prophetic announcement of a day of the Lord. Now, day of the Lord, it, it shows up in about seven different other uh, books. And uh, it's, it's generally thought of. And the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls also thought this, and they were big followers of Isaiah, that the day of the Lord was a time when it would be a removal of evil and sinfulness in the world. And everybody would get along. The Essenes, who again wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they believed it was it was right upon them. And their their founder, his very name, is the teacher of righteousness. That's Isaiah fifty three. That's what they say about Jesus. He's the teacher of righteousness. Makes the many righteous by his knowledge. Not by his death. That's not what 53 says. But in Malachi 3, God again addresses the day of the Lord. They're, they're all kind of different. There's some uh, renditions or some chapters that, that the day of the Lord is uh, only as to Christianity, a dominant son, or it's against the nations, or it's against the nations, all Gentiles, and Israel. Uh, it just differs. But Malachi 3 gives us a complete new outlook. And it's God's final words on the subject. Again, the writings in antiquity were oftentimes just for those people. They, they look like prophecy. But they can't happen in the real world. If it can't happen in the real world, it's not prophecy. God has another purpose. It can be anything from from uplifting those people in a harsh time who couldn't read, a society of ignorance, people basing their, 
their, their entire uh, life and relationship with other people just on emotion. And you know how bad that can be if you act just on emotion without thinking. So, and for religious purposes, just creating religion and even knowing what the Gentiles were going to do with Christianity, God knows all things from beginning to end, causing some controversy, making it interesting for God. And, and of course, there is prophecy, there is prophecy that can happen in the real world. And that's what the day of the Lord is about. In the day of the Lord, and we know it's here, and I'll get to that in a moment. We know it's here. It's very simple. Uh, I've heard Jews for Judaism, and Michael Skoback say, it's when, it, it, it's when we all stop sinning. God will come back. Or I guess he means as many as we can get that are possible. That's, that's, not, that's not in the, the scripture. There's nothing in the scripture that says when, the, when all of the Jewish people together as the man Israel, and they're supposed to be all together. That, that whole concept came at when they all gathered at Horb and God made the covenant with them. That was 100% of the Jewish people. And they had to agree to a man to accept the teachings God gives Moses. And then to them. 100% and you do exactly what he says. And of course there's a lot of vagueness in a lot of these commandments. And the oral tradition started like it says... You know, you will celebrate Shabbat. Well, how? You know, those kind of things. And an oral tradition occurred. And then finally, uh, it was decided, we, we got to write all these down. There's everybody out there, all rabbis, anybody that knows stories, write them down. And that's what created the Talmud. God knew that's exactly what would happen by leaving his commandments and laws and rules and teachings so vague in, in many places. And he knew that they were going to associate the Dom with the saw, and the saw is the brother of Jacob, who God renamed Israel, eternal antagonists, almost enemies. And that's how this whole thing developed, that Adam was considered Rome, then Christian Rome. Rome fell, and today it's Christianity, a reference to Adam and Saul. So we find out what the purpose is in Malachi. First verse, God says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. Meaning he already knows there's not going to be a temple. That one's going to have to be built. He already knows. Because he comes with a covenant of friendship that says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. He knows it's not there. He knew the, of the Roman dispersal. He knew Rome was going to destroy it. Isaiah writes sin forgiveness for the exiles of the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom that return, all 13 tribes. And Jeremiah writes for the return of the dispersal of Rome. The diaspora and sin forgiveness is a part of it. The purpose of God is to return to his temple. He says, I'm sending him to clear my message, to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly, when it's rebuilt. But he has to come before that because he's got to get a man ready. He's got to have a, a Moses. He's got to have a representative. He's got a man who speaks his words, writes his words, and that he can speak through. They said Moses was his veritable mouthpiece on earth. And that man is described in Isaiah 53. That's what the description is for. Even the sages knew you had to have a description. They see chapter 11. A descendant of David is going to come. And they've only got one description. And they say, well, that sure doesn't look like King David. This man is suffering, familiar with disease that is shunned and despised. Accounted plague and afflicted by God. That doesn't sound like him, but that's got to be him. And that's exactly what they had written. And that's what's in the Talmud. And that, of course, is what Rashi disagreed with. He said, no. I don't know his reasoning behind it or anything. 
I, you know, I, I haven't studied Rashi that much. I know he's a great scholar, dearly beloved, and uh, and thought of and thought of very highly. Uh, I've read everything he has on his commentary on 53 and several other chapters, just to, well, like Malachi. But see, then I see that you can't you can't just go with everything somebody says in antiquity, no matter how smart they are, because they only had so much knowledge. You know, we're of the age of enlightenment, reason, knowledge, medicine, science, information, and now the internet. That, not so, not so in antiquity. For instance, verse 1 concludes with, the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. And there's, that always perplexed me, but I finally, when God was having me type Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, I had two books that he dictated to me, unpublished. Uh, for some reason, Jewish publishers are shying away from it. Matter of fact, everybody's been shying away from it. But that's where God wrote in, shunned and despised. Accounted play. It's like, you know, uh, we pray for Moshiach, but when he shows up, they shun him and despise him. And yes, they do. Yes, they do. That, that, part's, that part's taken care of. A lot of it's taken care of. My, well, we'll get to that. So that's his purpose. Let's go to Jeremiah. See your time is coming. He says it three times. One, see a time is coming, and then there's several verses that follow, all the way to 31. See a time is coming again. And then it, uh, the, it, it skips some verses, and then the last verse is, see a time is coming. Okay, here's, what they, here's basically what it says. See a time is coming, the Jewish people will return. Why? Because the land blooms again. From desolation and ruins, you know, see, see uh, uh, chapter 61, desolation and ruin. Well, Mark Twain went there in the late 1800s and said it's nothing but desolation, nothing standing. Well, after 1948, if you go look at Israel today, it blooms again. That's how I sum up that whole paragraph. There's a lot of different, you know, great scripture in it, great verses. Now, the last verse, it says, See, the time is coming. Jerusalem shall be rebuilt from here to there and there and here. Biblical markers. And uh, there's no question, it's, mo it, it's almost in impossible to identify them. But you can get enough to know that Jerusalem today is far, far larger and greater than Jerusalem of antiquity. It's a great metropolitan area now. So there it is. See, the time is coming. Land blooms again. See, the time is coming. The ruined cities are restored and Jerusalem is rebuilt. And that's simply the Jews have returned. God says, well, when you all return, I'll come back. That's all it is. He doesn't say everybody's got to be sinless. He doesn't say everybody's got to perform a certain amount of mitzvahs or anything else. He says, I know, I, I believe me, I know you all. You, you, I know you like the back of my hand. I know there's always going to be sinners above, uh, among you. I know he tells us in Malachi that many of you will never heed me. You know, and that's with the covenant of sin forgiveness at hand. And he's saying, I know. But you, but you know, when I, gave the, when I made the announcement that I was going to forgive your sins and that that would cause Torah written on your heart and everyone would heed me, that's what you would expect. But we know better. The reality is, no. And that's why he makes a scroll of remembrance for this day, this day of the Lord. It's to put in there those who he revere and esteem his name. The word he's not in Malachi, but esteeming his and revering his name includes heeding. <clears throat> How is Torah written on your heart? A metaphor? Okay, now moving into the <clears throat> verses of chapter 53 of Jews for Judaism that I want to address. They are verses 4, 5, and 10. This is the commentary for Jews for Judaism, in quotes. It's called Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. Verse 4. But in truth, it was our ills that he bore and our pains that he carried. But we had regarded him diseased, stricken by God, and afflicted. 
the kings now, re <clears throat> now realize that their spiritual assessment of the servant was completely backward. During the time of the servant's lowliness, those who knew him believed that his constant affliction proves that he is spiritually deformed. Otherwise, why would this nation be singled out for God's wrath over any other? But now, <clears throat> this is all due for Judaism. But now, with the servant's exaltation, they realized that the servant was not more wicked than them, but more righteous. So the Gentile nations in the, I guess, end times, the time of the Messianic era when David comes, uh, this, this time of uh, great change in the world, their assessment of the servant is reversed because they come to a true understanding of God's plan. So two billion Christians, two billion Muslims are going to say, the Christians are going to say, well, there's no Jesus. Who are we thinking? The Jews have been right all along. And all the Muslims doing the same thing regarding Allah. Allah means God, but it's a totally different God from the God of Israel. With the restoration of Israel and God's glory coming to dwell in the Jerusalem temple, the nations of the world will experience true sanctity, and a real connection to God. Personally, I believe, I believe the nations aren't going to be happy at all with the Jewish people saying, our Moshiach is here, and we're building a temple because God is with him. I don't think they're going, I don't think they're going to be real happy with the Jews. That may cause the ingathering that's always talked about and send plenty back to Jerusalem as opposed to peace and harmony among us, all nations. That is part of the exaltation, the messianic era. They will realize, this is the Gentiles still, or it's the kings, and as I said, they're Gentiles and they're the leaders. So I, when I read kings, I see Gentiles. And of course, as I have pointed out, that's not the witnesses. That's not, that's not who's talking in, in verse 4. That's not who's talking. It's the people who are made righteous. They're sick. And what's, what's the story of 53 about? It's about a man who becomes the righteous servant of God. And these people are righteous. So what's their problem? They're sick because they're not righteous. What does God do? Well, we're going to find out because the key to all that is Ezekiel. It's in there. He went through this. What, 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 what happens in 53, this story, he goes through this wounding. This chastisement, punishment. Okay, it's not wounding. That's the only one that's left out. Bruising and crushing. And God tells us why he's doing it to him. It's to, it, it's to make him suitable for God's purpose. Ezekiel has a furious spirit. I'll get to all this. Or I've gotten to it in other videos. I don't know. God will take care of that. I, I don't have to worry about it. It'll all come out as it's supposed to. They will realize that many of their activities were actively preventing God's presence from being manifest in this world, even though they had considered, considered many of these activities to be righteous and godly. So it's the Gentiles preventing God from coming. Really? Does anybody think they can keep God from coming? He made it clear in Jeremiah, when y'all return, when you, when you fix my land back up, when you build me my house, I'll be there. And I'll come with the covenant of friendship. And I'm going to forgive all your sins. What is this everybody needs to be sinless? If everybody is practicing Judaism, going to Yom Kippur, and they're in right standing with God, why do they have to be sinless? The covenant, the new covenant says, I forgive your sins. That's what the covenant is. It's in addition to the the first covenant with the Israelites. And there's an amendment to that in Malachi 3. The addition of sin forgiveness and the, addition, and the inclusion of an amendment with the confirmation, affirmation by God of you shall be my people and I shall be your God. Well, I mean, as long as you're mindful of the laws I gave Moses at Or, that's, that's, that's the first covenant. It's only new because it's being changed up a little bit. That's it. It's not new. God has always been the God of the Jewish people. It never ended, and he's starting it over with the new covenant. That's not what it is. 
But anyway, he comes back with sin forgiveness. That's not an issue. You return, I'll come back. I'll bring some covenant friendship, and I'm going to, uh, what, what, what ends up happening is all the remaining prophecies of the Hebrew model are fulfilled. And they're fulfilled with one man, God's righteous servant. Because he has the abilities and capabilities of those who are coming, those who have been prophesied to come, that don't have a description. you got four men coming. And only one description, the description of the righteous servant. Elijah's coming. He sends him in Malachi 3. That's Elijah. He, he shows up in verse 23. But he's the messenger. He's the man who has to recounsel son to the father, father to the son. Today, that's family members one to the other. And how does he do it? Well, the verse before that is, Be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses, <clears throat> of all my laws and rules for Israel. Is that so? So Elijah's purpose is the same as the righteous servant. Make them righteous. Bring them back to Judaism. Well, that's what the righteous servant has to do. That's how he's going to make them righteous, and he's going to convince them because one, they're sin free. It says make them any righteous. Well, they're sin free, but they have to know. It has to be announced. How do you announce a covenant? Well, how'd you get the first covenant, Jewish people? Moses. God talked to a man, and he gave it to you. And as one man Israel, you accepted it. The Gentiles have not prevented God from doing anything. Neither have the Jews. They do what he wants when he wants. In order for God's presence to be revealed in this world, there needs to be a billion, this is Jews for Judaism still, there needs to be obedience and humility toward God. This obedience does not have to be perfect because God doesn't demand from his creations that which they cannot deliver, but it needs to be accepting of God's sovereignty to the degree that humans are capable. Since all of mankind benefits from God's presence being manifested in this world, it would be appropriate that all of mankind participate in the work of preparing a resting place for God's presence. The, the way that this sanctuary for God would be prepared would necessitate the mankind purify its collective heart. Well, wouldn't that be interesting? Does Moshiach have to do that? How does he get mankind to purify its collective heart? <laughs> in order to build this dwelling place for God, mankind would need to strive to achieve humility toward God and to accept God's sovereignty. So the entirety of humanity, from the Chinese to the Russians to the Australians, every single human being, although not perfectly, have to strive to achieve humility toward God. Good luck, Moshe. That's what I would tell you. And I'm him. So, you know, I'm the man about to say 53, and this is the 16th video by now. And this is the first time you've watched it. You need to go back and listen to the others. <clears throat> and the witnesses are, the witnesses are the Jewish people. They're the witnesses who need to be made righteous. That's why they're sick. That's why they're in verses 1 through 6 in quotes. That's what this story is about. Now, what are all these words for? What's all this punishment and everything else? Well, we're going to find that in Ezekiel. It makes it real clear. So, purifying the hearts of the world. Okay. To purify the collective heart of his servant Israel, and his servant will then, oh, Okay, this task is placed on the Jewish people. Instead of purifying the collective heart of all mankind, God chose to purify the collective heart of his servant Israel, and his servant will then shine the truth toward the rest of mankind. Good luck with that. Okay, I have had that a little bit off, but these are his words. The nations will walk by that light and partake of the goodness of God. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3. 
And the way that God chose to purify the heart of his servant is through suffering. Isaiah 48, verse 10. With the exaltation of the servant, the nations will realize that it was through the servant that God was accomplishing his purpose in the world for the benefit of all mankind. The suffering that the servant bore should have been borne by all mankind. And if anything, well, as though the rest of mankind never suffered. Okay, the Jewish people have been more through more and more heinous, cruel acts of violence and murder and, and being shunned and despised and, and thought of and accounted as uh, afflicted by God. But, but you're not alone in this world of harshness, Mr. Michael Skoback, Jews for Jews. You're not alone in this. There have been many a nation that no longer exists today. If anything, you've been the lucky one. You've been the one God made sure stayed here. There's another way to look at it, isn't there? The nation should have carried the brunt of the suffering, not us, as he would say. But it was their weaknesses that was more directly standing in the way of God's purpose for the world. So again... It's the Gentile sinning that has kept God from coming back to the Jewish people and placing a sanctuary amongst them. That's what did it. Well, let's just pass the blame while we're at it too, Mr. Scoback. Let's pass the blame. Isaiah 53. This is what it describes. This is what we're looking for. Put it all together. A man that God does not like. A sinner whose life is full of bad events, sickness, and suffering. God's righteous servant will have had persistent hardships and troubles, severely injured, and have been grievously affected, especially by disease. None of which at all <clears throat> of the Jewish people at one time. Again, they had to be gathered as one to be called the man Israel. And all of these things would have to apply to all of them at one time. It's never happened. Any more than at one time they had been plagued with disease by God, that they would offer themselves for guilt. It's never happened. And quite frankly, it can't happen. You can't gather every Jew today. You think you can get, well, if you think you can convince all of humanity to say the Jew has been right about God all along, then I suppose you think you can gather all the Jews of the world and collectively offer it yourselves for guilt. But let me tell you what you go through. It's what Ezekiel went through, and he got pinned to the ground, tied with God's, the cords of God's power with his hands behind his back, laying on one side for 360 days facing Jerusalem. And then he got the foot for the sins of the house of Israel. Their punishment that you will bear, he tells him. And then he gets to flip over for 40 years on the right side for the punishment of the house of Israel. The punishment is clearly for their sins. It's what they're in exile for. So it's not vicarious suffering. He's just saying, you're going to suffer like they did to the extent I can get it from you. Because it's going to change you, Ezekiel, is what he would have told him. I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to rush through so I can get through all this. I'm trying to pass a few things up. Who are these kings? King is the title given to a male monarch. This is my commentary to what I just read. And, and I've already included some of it, so it'll go pretty quick. Is the title given to a male monarch in a variety of contexts. A monarch is a sovereign head of state in my... my Monarchy. A monarchy is a form of government which a natural person is head of state until death or abdication. The witnesses of the many made righteous by God's righteous servant, not kings who are silenced or startled in chapters 52, 13 through 15. Jews for Judaism does not address the part of the verse that says, but we had regarded him diseased. Again, it has to be all Jews at one time. 
when were the Jews, even by the Gentiles, regarded as diseased? No, sure, you can you can be ugly and say nasty things and say, oh, the Jews is like the disease, but, you know, but they haven't been. This is not perceptions. This is not how people think about you. This is a description of a real man, God's representative, his prophet like Moses, that he prophesied in Deuteronomy. And we think the Orthodox knows about him. Now, how... how why is it so difficult? Why, why does everybody got to be sinless? Is it because you're religious? I think so. Well, God chose an atheist, a Gentile. The arid land in verse 2, that's Christianity. I mean, he comes from Adam. He comes from a Christian land. And of the Jews, no people are with him. It's so easy to figure out. See, a time is coming. The land blooms again. See, a time is coming. Jerusalem's rebuilt. Then I will make a covenant with you. Okay, covenant's here. How do we know? Well, you got to have a spokesperson, don't you? God does. you got to have a prophet like Moses. Oh, yeah, Deuteronomy's going to send a guy back. wonder what he looks like. How do we identify him? Because I'm not going to believe anybody if I don't have a description. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Here's the description. This is what the sages said. Said Moshiach, the anointed one from chapter 11, will be described here. That's how we find him. Well, he's here. He's got to be here. The new covenant's here. Let's find him. Uh, it's like y'all think he's going to come back to you for Judaism, outreach you. Like, like uh, uh, I, I, I heard somebody ask Tolia, God had me listen to it, on the radio, and somebody called in and said, how do we know Moshiach's here? Here's his answer. I'll throw up the window and look out and Torah will be written on every heart. No, you go to Jeremiah. The land blooms again. I, I don't know how you look at everybody. You can see Torah written on the heart. I guess everybody's going to synagogue. But, You return, I'll return. I'm going to put my sanctuary amongst you. Y'all sin forgiven. I know many of you, that won't matter a bit. I'm writing a scroll of remembrance for that day. Bring Elijah. He's going to try. He, he's going to, he's got the same purposes as the uh, righteous servant. So already, who is he? Well, we got, this is, this is what's unfulfilled. Four men to come. Two prophecies to, uh, covenants to come. David. At his arrival, God makes the grant of his friendship covenant. So that's with David. He needs to announce that. And Elijah is the messenger. What's he the messenger of? New covenant. Who's the only man taken to heaven? Elijah, specifically in the Hebrew Bible. And God sends him back. you got to ask yourself, why? Because he can talk to the angel. Right? Give me the covenant. Okay, I'm going to go announce it now. Where's the description of him? He's got the same purpose as the purpose of the man in Isaiah 53. If it describes anybody, it's going to describe Elijah by purpose far greater than it's going to, going to describe Jesus Christ. Then see the single verse except the last one, the one that says he's a sinner. There's so many lies by him in that book, New Testament. I've, I've got a video on Doubt Me. Go look at it. Go look at what the verses really say. Go look at what happens when Jesus says, all the prophets say of me, I'll ride this ass into Jerusalem and the Gentiles will spit on me, mock me, scourge me, kill me, and I shall rise on the third day. All the prophets, huh? Well, I got 20 in your Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, not one says that. No one ever says that anywhere, even in biblical scripture, supposedly, that wasn't canonized. But there is one. Zechariah, I believe it's chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. It's definitely verses 9 and 10. The Messiah will ride an ass into Jerusalem, which just means he's humble. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm not riding an ass in to fulfill this verse, but I will be humble. God's making sure of that. As part of this process of being made suitable, where all those big, heinous words are listed, punished and chastised, not treatment taken from society, taken, cut off from the land of the living is what it says. Well, so was, so was Ezekiel. But I'm going to get to Ezekiel. Who are these kings? Okay, I've covered just about everything I need to cover. So, 
So I'm going to go to Isaiah 53, 10. And that is, that's the one, the one verse. I mean, there's still something to be fulfilled. I mean, you still have to, I still, I, I'm covering all the descriptive things. That's what the book of my life is about. It's called the life of the righteous servant. God of Isaiah 53. God dictated it to me. He's been with me from the womb. Unlike Jeremiah, who God was with from the womb, he became a godly priestly man. And that's what you would expect, devoted to God. He came to me for a totally different reason. To make my life one of suffering, familiar with disease, to fit every verse of Isaiah 53. And he's very thorough. He's very thorough. Now, he didn't speak to me until I was 50 years old, seven years after they removed a tumor from my colon that should have killed me, that metastasized and spread into lung cancer. And I was given no more than a month, month and a half to live. I mean, that's how they made it sound. I said, well, what does all that mean? They're showing me pictures of my lungs with all these white spots telling me that's cancer. And this is post-chemo for colon cancer, which never returned. And uh, they said, it's too advanced to treat. I said, what's all that mean? And they said, you're going to die and you're going to die soon. I mean, with that kind of stage four diagnosis, rarely does anybody make a year. And um, I never saw a doctor again from that day. And I haven't to this day. And that day was when the planes hit New York 20 years ago. Now, that's my proof that I offered myself for guilt. I'm supposed to be dead 20 years. I've been exposed to death four times. I've been shot through the abdomen, just about had my right leg removed after impaling it on a Coke bottle when I was 10 or 12. I mean, and I've got some 15 surgical scars just from accident. It seemed like every two years I was getting stitched up somewhere for something. And God orchestrated the vast majority of it. And he showed me that by his words and in vision. We've gone back to some of these events and say, he says, see? See what, was, see, what, see what happened? I said, didn't that make you feel bad? You've been with me from the one or thing? He said, Keith, I'm God. Things don't bother me unless I let them bother me. Like Christians. I just put him because he, he is he's been, he is a, he is a being in existence with emotions. That's that's his image in us. We are beings in existence with emotions, but God's emotions. He's been around forever, billions upon billions and billions of years. You know, as you get older, you'll find, young people, you'll find that your emotions aren't near as volatile. You tend to think yourself your way out of things, so you don't get banged up and this and that. You just you slowly, they don't affect you as much. That's why he loves the world and the story he created with the Jewish people. All the conflict. And then when he makes a heaven just for the Jews, they're the only people that are going there, not Christians, not Muslims. There's no, there's no, where, where there's, the, there's no 70 virgins in heaven. I've seen it. I've been there in vision so many times. I've been in the temple so many times. Because God would take me in visions in just about every chapter we study to really make it sink in, to make me understand these things that I'm teaching. This is the teaching of the teacher of righteousness. And, and when David comes, God has a reckoning with the shepherds. That's the rabbis. And he dismisses them. Well, somebody's got to tell them what that means because apparently they don't know because they never talk about it. They never talk about the day of the Lord. Their Messianic era doesn't have a day of the Lord. They never apparently received the new covenant. Or they say, we get the covenant, but who are you getting it from? Oh, Moshe, no, you're getting it from Elijah. Boy, wasn't he giving short shift. He was ran down. Well, we don't know if Elijah, he comes before David or after what. Uh, we should study his Torah and not worry of such things. It's too confusing from the prophets. Well, no, it's not. It's really easy. Return from the land of de after the land's been desolate, make it bloom, God comes back, puts a sanctuary there. That prevents you from ever being dispersed, defeated, dispersed again. That's what the seed of time is coming. Jerusalem's rebuild. It ends with you shall never be overthrown. 
defeat and disperse. I don't remember the exact words. That's what it says. But now what happens if you don't build that temple? Which means Elijah couldn't convince anybody. If Elijah's not successful, and it's pointing towards bringing, uh, recounseling the sons to the father, bringing people, the families back to Judaism, <clears throat> or to Judaism. Okay, but what it's really about is he's got to be known. He's got to be recognized. He's got to be held up high. Or he's never going to have the clout, the people behind him, to get that temple built, which will probably occur because Israel gets attacked again, like the Six-Day War. God says, if he's not successful when I come, I'm coming with utter destruction to the land. And he does not mean he's going to do it like Sodom and Gomorrah in his power. He means his creation is going to do it. The Middle East is going to destroy the Jewish people in that land someday. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily, and I don't think it is in the day of the Lord. But it's going to happen if this thing doesn't take off. This is the day of the Lord. Think about that carefully. He has returned to this earth. He has chosen a man. He has described that man. He expects these Jews to listen to him. Although he already knows in Malachi, I know many won't. I know many won't. You have 7 million Israeli Jews. Now that should ring a bell when you read something that says God comes with utter destruction. Would it have been different? He said, I'm gonna, when I come, I'm going to raise up armies. It's the same kind of statement. And what happened when he raised up Assyria? When he raised up Babylon? When he raised up Rome? What happened? Do you think they were expecting it? And did he really raise them up? No. He just, he just, he just looked up and said, well, there's Rome. They're coming. They're going to make it here. That's going to be ugly. There's Greece. Yeah, they'll be coming. There's Persia. Maybe I can use them. And he writes it as though he's doing it. Why? To put fear in his people. To, to try to make them stop sinning. To come to Judaism. That's God's way. I'll, you know, and if you don't, I'm going to punish you. You know, he never leaves you. That's made clear. He, he, there's one psalm where he says, it doesn't matter if every single one of you, the man Israel, turns their back on me, I'm not leaving you. I'm going to punish you, but I'm not leaving you. But anyway, I don't know. I don't remember which one it was. That's just kind of a summation of it. I remember reading it. Isaiah 53, 10. He, he doesn't really address it. He says it has to do with how the kings look at the Jews. And you know, it's not addressed how how God crushed them with disease, afflicted them with sickness, afflicted them with disease. With me, he not only afflicted me with disease, he disfigured me. He said, I touched you in the womb. That's why you have a you don't have a right breast and you have a short shoulder and a withered arm. He said, That's that's just to be part of fifty three. The cancer you got, you know what that's for? It's not to make you offer yourself for guilt. I didn't, I didn't crush Ezekiel. We just seized him. Jesus said, the Spirit seized me. A Spirit lit upon me and entered me, and I could hear God speak. Couldn't hear him speak before the Spirit entered him in that verse. Okay, that's because God's in his angel. There's a video on that. Uh, that's something the Jewish people don't know about. I have a wealth of knowledge the Jews don't know, and they shun and despise me. I, I, I send emails. God had me send emails to Toby Singer. You want to argue about Isaiah 53? Let's go. Nothing. 